All right, you ready for backsliding? Part two, all right? You came to the wrong church service, all right? So again, a disclaimer, you came to the wrong church service, the wrong teaching. We're talking about backsliding, so it will be a very hard topic. Uh, and no, I don't normally teach or preach like this. <laughs> so if some of you go, man, this pastor, he's just mean and stuff like that, I assure you I'm not always like this. Especially in person, I'm much different. But when you're teaching a topic that the Lord wants you to teach or preach about, you cannot compromise, you cannot water it down. So I have to give it as it is from where the Lord wants it to be delivered. All right, so we are going to do that. Let's go to Genesis chapter 13, please. Genesis chapter 13. We're going to be talking about backsliding part two. Genesis chapter 13, backsliding part two. <clears throat> I'm going to give you the reasons for backsliding. Reasons for backsliding. Now, I want to make the people understand this. These are not just a list of sins. So let me repeat that again. This is not just a list of sins of what people do when they backslide. These are actual causes. These sins are actual causes to why people backslide. That's important to understand. It's not like because a person backslides first, that's why these sins come out. So it is true that when you backslide first, then certain sins will come out of your life. There is no doubt about that. That's why, like I told you before, it's more of an inward thing you have to inspect. However, when we're talking about these list of sins, I don't want us to think these are the results from backsliding. I want to also point out these specific sins contribute to the inward part in backsliding. And you're going to notice that. You're going to notice because of these specific sins, they start the inward parts of the heart where we want to backslide. Okay? So if we settle the sin issues, then these wouldn't come out inwardly in our hearts for backsliding. Now, I'm, I don't want to park it there and spend too much time. But if you recall in our last section, the gradual process of backsliding, that was very, very good, where we showed an inward inspection of certain steps that lead us to backslide. Remember that? That was taken from the example of Genesis 13 in Lot's life. There was so much we learned from, so much we learned from. I took special time on that because there's just too much to learn over there. So this gradual process of backsliding that we saw the inward inspection in the heart, if we don't want to follow those same patterns, then this particular section, reasons for backsliding that we're going to look at, the actual causes for backsliding, we need to see, we need to target so that we can stop those things before that gradual process of backsliding keeps on going, okay? Okay. So we need to eliminate these actual causes. So let's talk about the causes, and I will, ex I will describe, I will explain these things briefly as possible when we go through them. Go to Genesis 13, 10, and it's the classic passage that we looked at the gradual process of backsliding in our last lesson. The Bible says, And Lot lifted up his eyes, and beheld all the plains of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. So notice that Lot, he coveted, he saw something. Covetousness is the reason and it's the cause to why we backslide. You wouldn't backslide, you wouldn't gradually get into sin and sin more and then neglect your spiritual walk if you didn't covet it to begin with. See that? So notice right here, this particular sin is not just a result from backsliding. It is the cause. What we see, what we desire. Because that was the start, 
that's the reason why we neglected our spiritual duties more and more that's why we proceeded more and more into outward sins into further sins do we understand that but if we never coveted think about this if you never coveted that world to begin with maybe your church attendance would have been more faithful if you never coveted to begin with maybe the complaining attitude the bitterness those outward sins those sins that result from backsliding wouldn't have even happened so notice right here the point is this outward sins the resulting sins would not have happened from this gradual process of backsliding which wouldn't even have happened if it wasn't for that cause of sin covetousness if we eliminated that thing you wouldn't even have to learn all the parts about gradual process of backsliding and the outward results of sin does that make any sense to you the point is if you forsook your sin at the beginning a lot of the complications would have been solved you wouldn't even have to study and learn these lessons on how to conquer addictions how to conquer sins how to have a closer relationship with Jesus Christ if you went by the simple notion of just forsake your sin to begin with if you forsook that to begin with you wouldn't even have to know all this stuff but unfortunately now us Bible believing Christians we appreciate deeper insights in preaching we need more convicting preaching because the reason why we want to know those things is because we already complicated our lives so we need to know something deeper and complicated does that make any sense so it's like as if we need dr david peacock and pastor mike reagan and then i do complicate things too i inspect the process too at times i'm not as good as those preachers but sometimes those kind of sermons we get a big blessing on and you and i know that that convicts us you know why they go through deep inspection of the hearts and we get a blessing out of that but you know you and I wouldn't even have to hear about all that learn all that if we forsook our sin to begin with do you understand that that's why it's so important to just do the simple thing forsake that sin don't start it then you won't have to go through all these complicated uh, process and we need a great complicated uh, a great preaching that goes through that complicated process an inspection process all right go to Genesis 19 Genesis 19 verse 26 now you'll notice from this chart the person did a good job in showing the causes of backsliding and he'll give some biblical examples as well so he pointed out here are people who lived right for the Lord because remember backsliding remember this is not just list of sins this is backsliding meaning these are people who lived for God who served God who are involved in his ministry yes that includes Judas this devil was casting out devils can you believe that this devil was casting out devils so these are people who are serving God in the ministry but what made them lose it it's because of these sins so these sins are actual causes to what made them lose their spiritual work for God and you have to look at yourself and say what sin caused me to lose my current relationship with God what sin made me lose my current results that I've done for God the accomplishments and the fruits that I've worked hard so hard for the Lord you can lose those things why what sin was it that made you lose those things you have to think about that uh, the list of sins that he gives over here you're going to notice it pretty much matches uh, with the list that I'm going to give to you it's the same idea even though the mentions here the list that he gives is different from mine but you're going to notice that they share the same relationship the second one is society society let's look at verse 26 the Bible says but his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt so notice that Lot's wife 
she was going to escape the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. So she was on the right path, but something caused her to look back. Back slide, see that? From the right direction. What was it? Society. So sometimes there are people that you're used to, a place that you're used to, that it turned into love and desire that caused you to backslide. So uh, quite often how I've seen people lose their relationship with Jesus Christ, even though they were doing very well in church to begin with, is because they started to spend more time in the society they were in rather than in church. Some of you are pumped up after Jubilee. Why? You're in the right society. But when you get out of that, you know what happens when you're in the wrong society. See, you all of a sudden backslide so quick. What happened to you? I thought that you were on fire for the Lord, and here you are doing all this much for the Lord. What caused you to slide a bit now? Society did. That's why this is so important to understand. And this is a heavy topic. It's a very convicting topic because um, it's pointing out things why we slide a bit. Remember, backsliding is not you committing significant sins. Backsliding is not that you're total apostate and you're wrong. Backsliding is any small thing that you slide a bit, you automatically slid back. That's what it means. Back means it's not going forward. Does that make any sense? So that shows all of us have this problem. And I mean that every single one of you, I don't care how spiritual you are in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay, let's go to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. This thing, backsliding, we ought to take very seriously because we took it as normalcy now. We don't consider it as a sin, backsliding. We take it as something normal. Because why? You have a million excuses. Job, health, legitimate stuff. All right, let's look at Matthew chapter 26, and then we'll look at verse 70. Verse 70. Uh, the Bible points out right here, the third reason for backsliding is fear. Fear. The Bible says in Matthew 26, 70, but he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him. And then verse 72, he denied again. And then verse 74, he began to curse and to swear. Notice that Peter, he was probably the top three that Jesus entrusted in the ministry. But he, even a guy like that, started cursing and swearing just like any law sinner. If I started cursing and swearing, your mind might change about me, wouldn't you? You might say, man, he's Man, he's such a messed up person. I thought he was, man, pastor. I thought he was pastor. He was so spiritual. You see that? That th backsliding is very serious. It can change a person whom you might think is a saint to total 180. That's extremely important to understand. So fear is a huge factor in Peter's life. He actually feared, and because of that, it made him turn 180. So you have to keep a guard on your fears. What are some things that you're scared of? That thing can make you turn 180. And don't pretend the devil ain't going to use that sometime in your future because so far you seem to be doing all right. All right, let's go to Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16. Proverbs chapter 16. Now, after this verse, I'm not going to turn to these verses. I'm just going to... Uh, I'm just going to mention them to you. What I would ask for you to do is to write them all down, and that way you can get those list of sins. Let's go to uh, Proverbs chapter 16, and then we'll look at verse 18, Proverbs 16. And then we'll look at verse 18. The fourth one is a haughty spirit, haughty spirit. Mark this one down. I, this is the number one reason to me for the sin that causes people to backslide. The Bible says, Pride goeth before destruction, 
and a haughty spirit before a fall. Now, notice the wording right here. It shows backsliding. It's not just a sin it's giving out. It's showing backsliding. Pride destroys you. That means that you are living. Fall. See that? That's the same thing as backsliding. That means you are standing up. You are doing well. Does that make any sense? So that's why it's so important that within your walk with Jesus Christ, here you are going, and then you're growing, and then you slide. And that's the thing that we want to know why you slide. It's this point here, the significant point. What caused me to backslide? One huge factor is pride. That's why we have to keep a guard on that one. And the fifth one is Proverbs 14, 14. Proverbs 14, 14. Which is selfishness. Selfishness. Proverbs chapter 14. Okay. Here? Okay. The next one is selfishness. That's everything, pretty much. It's as significant as pride. You might recall that I would quite often say self-centeredness. You might recall me saying that. I'll quite often say self when I deal with all sorts of sins. The reason why is everything that you do pretty much in life is rooted in self-centeredness, in what you want, what pleases you, what's most comfortable to you. You do not like hardship. You don't want something new that stresses you out. See, you're stuck in your life, your mentality, your mindset, what's most comfortable that fits you. That's the root cause of everything, pretty much, to why you commit a lot of mistakes and wrongdoing. Think about it. If you were out of the picture, do you think you would have made those mistakes that you made those mistakes with your relationships with other people? If you completely thought about others, you wouldn't have that problem with certain relationships you had with other people. But see, you're always thinking about yourself, yourself, and what others should do for you. Because poor you, poor you. See that? It's all about you. That's why we have to understand within these reasons for backsliding that selfishness is a huge factor. Self-centeredness is a significant destructive factor to your backsliding. So... Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 14. I'll read that briefly. The Bible points out right here, the backslider in heart. See that? So backsliding is mentioned here. Shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. All of that is selfishness to why a person backslides. The sixth one is idolatry. Go to Exodus 32. Exodus chapter 32 and then verse 8. The sixth one is idolatry. Go to Exodus chapter 32 and then we'll read verse 8. Again, I'm just going to be reading it quickly. You just write it down, all right? If you don't have time to turn there, then just listen and write down. That's my advice. They have turned aside quickly out of the way. See that? That's backsliding there. Why? They have made them a molten calf and worshipped it. There's something you prioritize more than God, that you're infatuated more than God. You're obsessed with more than God. That's why you backslid in your Bible reading and prayer life, because there's something more important to you than your time with God. That's why that job or that school or whoever you're spending time with is more important to you than God, which is why you slid from going to church to worship Him, because you worship those things more, those people more. 
All right, the seventh thing is disobedience. Disobedience. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 11. 1 Samuel chapter 15. And we'll be turning to verse 11. The Bible reads, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me. See that backsliding. Why? And hath not performed my commandments because he did not obey what God told him to do. Notice right here, it's another root factor as much as selfishness that why you backslid is simply you did not do what God told you to do. If you did everything God told you to do, think about it, you probably wouldn't commit one sin then. It's that simple. All right, Joshua chapter 7, verse 1 through 24. Joshua chapter 7, verse 1 through 24. The eighth one is love of earthly goods. Love of earthly goods. The Bible points out, but the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zariah, uh, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of of Israel. He points out right here that in verse, let's see, verse, there's a good one, 10, verse 10, and the Lord said unto Joshua, get thee off, wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, for they have even taken of the accursed thing and have also stolen and disassembled also. And they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Now, notice right here, I like how I said it. It's the same wording as the other two verses. Turn back, turn back, backsliding. But right here, this backsliding is not in front of God, as the verses would mention, but to their enemies. In other words, the enemies who try to attack your Christianity, you won't be able to confront them. Not only will you turn your back to God, but you're going to turn your back to your enemy too. And your back is your weak spot. That means you're not focusing on them and you're not fighting against them. And you've exposed your vulnerable side for the enemy to shoot you in the back. So backsliding is not just to God. Believe it or not, it's, e it's even to the devil, to your enemies. That's something serious to think about. Why? Because of that's why I said verses 1 through 24. You have to read the whole thing. Points out right here, Achan loved earthly goods. He loved earthly goods too much. And what he did by that, because I love the world too much, I love earthly things too much, he turned his back not only to God, but to the devil, to spiritual warfare. Why? When you love earthly goods, you're not thinking about warfare. You're thinking about settling down, getting comfortable. Did you understand what I just said right there? So that means that in warfare, you're not paying attention to the devil. When you're settling down in the world, you're not paying attention to the devil. When you're getting comfortable in the world, you're not paying attention to the devil. You're not paying attention to spiritual warfare. You're not paying attention that I have enemies out there who want to tear me apart, who want to destroy me with sin with the world. You don't think about that. So when you turned your back to God, you've also turned your back to the devil. I, I'm wasting so much time. I, gotta, I cannot park it there. But do you understand there's so much to park with these specific sins? These are actual causes to backsliding. And these verses truly say it is backsliding with these sins that are done. Okay, uh, the, other, the ninth one is love of money. Go to John 13, John 13, verse 29. And again, we won't have time. I won't give you time to turn over there and read it. So just write it down, John 13, 29. And then just hear me from the verses. That way you can see that 
backsliding is specifically tied to these the sins. Amen. All right, John 13, 29, love of money is the ninth one, love of money. The Bible says, John 13, 29, for some of them had thought because Judas had the bag that Jesus had said unto him, buy those things that we have need of against the feast or that he should give something to the poor. Now, notice right here that Judas, he was already given the impression of by the disciples that he prioritized money, financial stuff for the ministry, of course. But we know that he was a thief, the Bible says. Because he prioritized money so much, notice that in verse 27 that Satan entered inside Judas Iscariot and Jesus told Judas that whatever he's going to do, to do it quickly. And then when Judas did his own thing that Jesus granted him permission to do, the other people who knew about his testimony thought it related to money yeah. for a good cause, yeah. feeding the poor. Right. Is that how other people see you? So he, back, so he backslid here. The devil entered into him. He was doing a good thing working for Jesus' ministry, but his testimony that whole time, which people noticed, realized it, it was more about the poor, the money, rather than, like Mary, Jesus. It's all about Jesus, putting the anointment at his feet. Okay, tenth one is lust. Tenth one is lust. Go to Nehemiah 13, verse 26. Nehemiah chapter 13 and verse 26. Now notice right here that the children of Israel, which is very interesting, a sin that seemed to be a huge cause where the Jews constantly messed up as a nation and would repeat their cycle over and over again and God finally gave them up and said, I'm done with you. You'll notice it had to do with marrying strange women. Think about Solomon. What made him lose the kingdom? Strange women. You know one thing I noticed about Bible-believing churches too? And I've seen it with young people. Some people might think that when they go to certain Bible-believing churches, man, their young people are great. They love the Lord. And look at them sing. Look at them read the Bible and stuff like that. You don't know what they're going through that other people and I know about. Some of them, don't. they do that, but it's all for a show. And then when they mess around with the wrong person that they fall in love with, they're out of church. Yeah, they were doing so well. They sang so well. They quoted verses so well. They dressed so well. And oh, oh yeah, and then they backslid. Happens to them, it'll happen to you. All right, Nehemiah 13, 26. It's because of lust. Nehemiah 13, verse 26, the Bible says, Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. See that he was doing well, but he backslid. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. The other one is ambition for power. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Ambition for power. And if none of these sins will get to you, there are two things that will get any holy pastor who is spirit-filled and who is famous, and many even other pastors would respect him and Bible believers around the world. It's ambition for power. Mixed up with pride. I see that all the time, so I get sick and tired of that. Acts chapter 8 and verse 19. The Bible says, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. So he wanted power. Of course, it was a spiritual power. He wanted that. But Simon Peter point out, it pointed out to him at verse 22 that, no, what you had was wickedness in your heart. And that person, Simon, was doing very well. He believed in God at uh, verse 10 through 12, repented, cleaned up his life, and then that ambition for power got to him. 2 Timothy 4, 2 Timothy 4, the twelfth one is love of the world. 2 Timothy 4, love of the world. The difference with that one 
and then love of earthly goods is because love of earthly goods as demonstrated from Achan's life you'll notice that he's not a worldly person see you think that because you're not worldly that you're living right but you have a few things in your closet Achan earthly goods so you are backsliding there's a distinction with this one and love of the world all right second Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10 and the obvious one is love of the world Verse 10, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Now, there's something very serious here. Demas was with the Apostle Paul, so he must have went through the stonings, the beatings, the persecution. I mean, you got to give credit to this guy. But then he got out of that. See that? He backslid. Why? He loved this present world. Now, here's something that you need to think about. You can also commit the sin of worldliness where you may not have things in your closet, you may not have earthly goods, so then you're living a holy Christian life, but see, deep down inside your heart, you keep loving that world. And then as you keep serving God like the Apostle Paul, that love, the love of the world gets bigger and more attractable, more attractable, then comes bitterness and complaining and covetousness, and then after that, you fall into the world. So worldliness does not have to meet your standard, uh, your, your standard definition of I'm living completely apostate, worldly life like every worldly lost sinner. A worldly person is someone that's inside the heart worldly. All right? Because th the verse says, loved this present world. Then that's being a worldly person. All right, let's uh, go to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. Why are you saying all that, preacher? Well, I hate to say this, okay? But it must be said. Sometimes you have to think about your testimony, obviously, and then your role as a pastor. So you don't want to lose authority. But I want to say this. That way people can understand why I'm so hard on my teaching and preaching. I wouldn't be saying all this if I don't know things about myself. You, want, you know what makes very good preaching? What makes very good preaching is when you inspect your heart. And a lot of times, 99% of the time, when you inspect your heart, it hits everybody pretty much what they went through. All right, Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8. Joshua chapter 1 and then verse 8. All right, I want you to write all these verses down. Uh, we're not going to turn to these verses. But now we're going to look at causes for backsliding. Causes for backsliding. Well, Pastor, I thought you already went through the causes of backsliding. I know that I quite often put in reasons for backsliding with causes, but actually there's a subtle distinction and a very important distinction. The reason why the distinction is important is that if we know how distinct these terms are, then we can practice them. We can practice them and not conflate them and then just think that they're all the same and then not see these subtle distinctions where the devil has gotten us. So we have to know how subtle these distinctions are and catch them. That way, when we catch them as we live our everyday life, we don't commit those same mistakes. Okay, now with that said, let me uh, draw the distinction here with reasons and causes. Now, the reasons for backsliding are actual reasons why we backslide. In other words, there are legitimate reasons, and sin is always a legitimate reason. It's just that when you say it to other people, it doesn't sound sinful. So let's say, for example, well, you know, I'm just too busy. All right, that's a legitimate reason. You know, I got work and they're slaving me. I got problems going on in my family and then I'm trying to get all my life together. Look, those are, that's a legitimate reason. What do you think we're going to say to you? You're a sinner and you're not right with God? Of course not. Because it's legitimate. But see, we don't know, but you and God know. And that's a cover-up for that legitimate reason is a cover-up for your sin. What is it? You're just lazy. But we're not going to call you that, obviously. 
But you and God know, you just know the plain reason is you just don't want to go through discomfort. You do have to lose some sleep here. You do have to go through some stressful things here. Yes, when you come to church, you have to pay the price of going through several bad days. You, your flesh just doesn't want to be convinced of that. Who doesn't work in a job where they went through something bad, yet they go anyway? Do you understand? So, see, these are reasons. But they're actually sins. But we call it reasons in our mind, but they're actually sin. Now, the causes are going to be actual causes. So I know that these sins that we looked at may be the cause for us to backslide, and I quite mentioned that, I've often mentioned that, these sins made us, they caused us to backslide. However, there's a deeper cause. There's a more real cause to why we backslide. So, in other words, if we do these things faithfully, then not even these things might cause us to backslide. In other words, so I pointed out these sins are the ones that caused us to backslide, right? But there's a deeper cause to why we backslide. So if we do these deeper causes correctly, then these other causes that we looked at won't happen. So you would like to know them, obviously. So what is it, Pastor? Well, it ain't as deep as you think. It's very simple, and you've heard it quite often, but you think that it doesn't work all the time. All right, first one is failure to read the Bible. Failure to read the Bible. If you read that book faithfully every day, and with some of you, you might need it three times a day. If you were to do that, then you think that these sins will have much of, more of a hold on you. See that? That's why these are very powerful. Think about this. What caused you not to do these sins all this time, even though they were your legitimate reasons to do so? You know what caused you not to do those sins? Because you heard preaching that changed your life. But if you never attended church and never heard the preaching that changed your life, what would happen? See, it caused you to backslide. That's why these spiritual duties are so important. Because neglect of those things are the actual causes. They're the deeper roots. They're the deeper causes to what made you do these sins. Okay, so it's Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. The second one is failure to pray. Failure to pray. And that one is Matthew chapter 26, verse 41. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 41. The third one, so remember, write them all down. I wasn't kidding, okay? I wasn't kidding. The third one is failure to attend church. Failure to attend church. That's Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. That's Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. The fourth one is failure to yield to the Holy Spirit. Failure to, lead to, the, uh, to yield to the Holy Spirit. That's Galatians 5, 16. That's Galatians 5, 16. The sixth one is failure to, uh, fifth one, excuse me, fifth one is failure to confess Christ. Failure to confess Christ. In other words, uh, you don't uh, publicly proclaim Jesus Christ to others. Uh, please watch the teaching on confession that I taught you. Then you'll understand what really confessing Christ is all about. Uh, the actual cause, the next one, is failure to mortify the flesh. Failure to mortify, mortify the flesh. That's Romans 8.13. Romans 8.13. And I do apologize. I didn't give you the verse. Failure to confess Christ is Matthew 10.32. Matthew 10.32. And then don't forget uh, Romans 8.13. 
The other one is uh, failure to take care of the eyes. Failure to take care of the eyes. That will preach. That will preach. What are you looking at? Okay. There's a reason why these things came out. Okay. That's Psalm 101.3. Psalm 101.3. And then the other one is Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12, and then verse 2. The other one is failure to press forward. Failure to press forward. You know why uh, you backslid? You got guilty because you sinned again and you stopped coming to church. Simple. That's why I keep telling you, I don't care how many times you mess up, just pick yourself back up and get right with God. That's it, all right? You're in good company, don't worry. You're in good company, all right? You're not the only one. Don't feel guilty, all right? You're in very good company right here, and I'm no better than you. Just get right with God and come back. I don't care if it's been three years. I hope they're watching online, okay? If you've been out of church, a Bible-believing church, or if any of our people been out of a Bible-believing church for many years, hey, doors always open, all right? Come back. It's that simple, all right? So Philippians 3.14, Philippians 3.14. And then the other one is uh, failure to confess sins. Failure to confess sins. I cannot emphatically say that. That's 1 John 1. 1 John chapter 1, verse 6 through 9. 1 John chapter 1, verse 6 through 9. Now, why do I emphatically say that? I think that's the most important one compared to every other spiritual duty. You know why? That's the only time you spiritually inspect yourself and you ask God's power to cleanse you and to rejuvenate you to get right with God. I know exactly why a lot of people don't come back to church, they don't read the Bible, they don't pray, and they do all these causes. You don't practice confession of your sins often, do you? You know what would shock your pastor the most? What would shock your pastor the most is if I did a survey and you don't put your names and then I asked you how often do you confess your sins? Like once a week? Once a day? Three times a day and stuff like that. How faithfully do you do that? I might be shocked the kind of answers that I get about the last time I did it was three weeks ago or something like that. No wonder. You know why? You don't want to think about your sin. I don't want to park it here, but you don't want to think about your sin. You don't want to think about you failed God. You don't want to think about where you messed up in. You don't want to think about all that. And you just want to move on with your life doing what you're most comfortable with. That's your backsliding. I told you it was going to be a very hard teaching. Like I told you all before is that uh, I don't teach like this or preach like this all the time. So... Especially in person, I am not like this, but you just were so lucky or God somehow ordained it for you where you just happened to hit just the right teaching today to get upset and get offended. So I do apologize for that. You just happened to do that. All right. All right. Checkups for backsliding. Y'all want this? Imagine I close it off here, man. Checkups for backsliding. You ready? This is very, very good. Now, I know a lot of these things was already good, but this would be the best part, okay? That way you can keep tabs on yourself and see if you're backsliding. If you ask these questions, I would recommend this. Side note, if you put these questions, if you ask these questions every day as you confess your sins to God, I'm, I will not be surprised how much your life can change. You ready? All right. Here are the checkups for backsliding. Question one, are you losing the power of the Spirit? Are you losing the power of the Spirit? That's Luke chapter 4, verse 1 and verse 14. And again, write them down. All right. Luke chapter 4, verse 1 and verse 14. Actually, I think we can turn over there. All right. We have a bit of time. Let's go over there. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. And 14. Didn't you know even Jesus Christ himself, who never sinned, never sinned, who is perfect and holy, 
needed the filling power of the Spirit. Yes, he needed that too. Why? Because he realized he's human nature. And before he was tempted by the devil in the wilderness, he didn't think that, hey, I can do it all on my own and stuff like that. Because he recognized his human nature in spite of his nature of deity, that because of that human nature side, I need the filling power of the Spirit for that particular side. See, even Jesus had sense that I have a weak spot here that I need to keep a guard on. Luke chapter 4, verse 1, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. See that? He made, that's why he wanted to fulfill all righteousness, get baptized from John's baptism, have the Holy Ghost as a dove descend upon him. Why? Before his temptation in the wilderness. You see that? If you, if you really do not ask yourself this question, you wonder why you mess up. If God Almighty realized how important this filling of the Spirit is, my goodness, shouldn't you, you and I more? Verse 14, verse 14, after the temptation in the wilderness, and Jesus returned after that temptation in the wilderness, notice, in the power of the Spirit. He still retained it. He didn't lose it instead, in spite of fasting 40 days. Do you realize that? That's huge. He didn't backslid. He didn't slow down a bit. That's huge. This is a very powerful question. Even if you're not sinning, like I told you, even if you're not sinning, even if you didn't mess up like Jesus Christ, you should still check up yourself and say, am I filled? Am I losing the power of the Spirit? All right. The next one is Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. Literally, how I wish that I could go one, uh, this can go two months, two months on this topic. Proverbs 29, verse 18. It's a very good topic. So much we can learn and glean and apply practically. Proverbs 29, 18. The second question is, are you losing joy? Are you losing joy? The Bible says, where there is no vision, the people perish. See that? You wonder why they end up in a mess. Why? But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. See that? He's retaining his life. He's not slowing down. He's not backsliding, falling off. He's keeping it. And notice that keeping is, may, is in the same level of happiness. It's in the same level of happiness. So if you're not happy today, why? You got to check up yourself. See that? Yeah, even if you're right with God, look, I recognize sometimes really bad, sorrowful things can happen, especially at funerals, and you're not ecstatic, you know, with happiness 100% like that, but quite often the devil takes advantage of that legitimate, remember, legitimate reason, right? Legitimate sorrow where he'll put a temptation in there, and that little bitterness, that little doubt, that little questioning sure creeps in. That's why it's important to ask yourself, why am I unhappy? That is powerful to ask. All right, third one is, are you losing peace? Are you losing peace? Isaiah chapter 48, verse 18. Isaiah chapter 48, verse 18. You know what I believe? I could be wrong. And by the way, I'm not saying that my teaching is the one that solves everything by no stretch of the imagination. No, there are plenty of teachers and preachers out there that I do want to hear more often. And they got such rich nuggets of topics that I want to learn and glean from. But I do strongly believe just this one teaching will solve everything in your life. And you don't need to hear any other topic or any other thing. If you just hear this thing, your life is solved. All right, Isaiah 48, verse 18. Why? Because all the problems in life is rooted in all these things. Uh, third question, are you losing peace? Are you losing peace? If so, then the tendency is because of sin. Isaiah chapter 48, and then verse 18, the Bible says, Oh, that thou hast hearkened to my commandments, 
Then had thy peace been as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. Peace so abundant, if you what? If you kept on to God's commandments. See that? Jude 1.16. Jude 1, 16. Well, I was hearkening to God's commandments, but I don't have peace. Ah, hearken. In other words, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Yeah, you can hear it, but you don't believe it, right? Are you really hearing it? And really hearing it is really believing it, really listening to it, really putting your whole heart into it. All right. Uh, Jude one sixteen. Jude one sixteen. I like this question. This, this has been very helpful. You ready for this? Are you murmuring? Uh, uh, then you know you're backsliding. <laughs> because why? There's covetousness in there. You coveted something that the lost people have, the wicked people have, and other good Christians have, and that caused you to backslide. So then the murmuring comes out. See, that, that question, if you were to ask that, you get your causes and your reasons all set. All right. Are you murmuring? Jude 1, 16, the Bible says, These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaking great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. I like that verse. I might quote that later in the preaching. All right, let's go to 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3. If that passage, which I believe strongly matches with 2 Peter chapter 2, then I'll point out right there that these people were actually doing well, preaching, working in the ministry well, but then there's something there that sin crept in that caused them to backslide, and Jude says it's because they murmured. Something caused them to murmur. To become discontent, complain at God. All right, the fifth one is, are you being persecuted? Are you being persecuted? This is really, really good because it points out right here, if, you know how you can tell you're backslidden? If you're not being persecuted. <laughs> now, I, I didn't say it, God said it. And I'm not saying, and let me repeat that again, I'm not saying that you're not right with God if nothing bad happened to you. You can live right for God and you could be doing great things for, the God, for God and things are going well with you. Amen? Praise the Lord for that one. But what God says right here, and if what God says it, when God says it, there is some general rule here and there is a tendency that does happen, is that if you do live godly in Christ Jesus, in your life somewhere, there should be something bad happening to you. So if you're complaining about, God, why are bad things happening to me after all that I served you? The devil got you to backslide where you got this thing right, persecution, but he got you with murmuring. Yeah, yeah thou preach. Bless God. Amen. Open up altar call. That's good stuff. Can you believe it? You guys are doing well if you're going through bad times. You guys are doing well. God is pleased with you. You're not backsliding. But the devil got you somewhere now with murmuring. Man, that's good stuff. Amen. Man, I'm enjoying myself. Amen. Because like I'm preaching at myself. That's good stuff. And then just like you, that's good stuff. Amen. And then weeks later, I didn't learn my lesson, right? All right. 2 Timothy 3.12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall, shall suffer persecution. All right, uh, Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12. Sixth question, are you being punished? Are you being punished? Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 5. John Wesley is probably one of the holiest people you'll ever read in history. If you read his life, I mean... They called themselves, uh, the enemies called them Methodists because they lived by standards, by a practice, by a method that was so constant in holiness. Well, I don't believe in rules, you know. They have rules. You talk about extreme conservative fundamentalist legalism. All right, because why? 
they didn't make rules as Pharisees do, and then their hearts is all messed up. No, it's because their heart was in the right place. They made rules to keep their hearts right with God. So John Wesley was so holy, but he even asked himself this question. I think that was the secret to his holiness. Because whenever he had a good day, you know what? He was discouraged. But see, you and I, when we have good days, we're so happy. When we have bad times, we get discouraged. But when John Wesley is going through bad times, he's happy. Story illustrates where, you know, he always went through persecution every day, actually. When he was preaching the word of God. But then there was a particular day that he didn't go through any persecution. He just had a good day. And you know what? That discouraged John Wesley. He didn't say, thank you, Lord. You're a great God. You know, oh, it's a wonderful day. Thank you for your blessings bestowed on me because I had a good day today like we do. He was discouraged because he knows that verse. Yeah, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So he believed in that verse so strongly. So then he's like, oh, God, uh, please help me go through persecution. And you and I would never pray that. What happened was there was a guy who saw John Wesley and he threw a brick at him, like really hard. I mean, he could have died. That brick went past him. It didn't hit him. It missed him barely and it hit hard at the wall. You know what John Wesley did after that? Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Man, conviction, man. All right, are you being punished? Hebrews 12, 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son. Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Now, uh, I, don't, I have to wrap it up, but let me explain a bit here because it is worth mentioning. There is a distinction with punishment and persecution. When you're going through bad times, this is one thing I learned, a lot of it is self-inflicted. It's not the Lord giving you persecution. A lot of it is self-infliction. So then because of that, the Lord punishes us. The more biblical word is actually chastised, not punished. But when the Lord, just excuse me, I'm going to use that term punished, even though that's not the biblical word, but when God chastises us, disciplines us, punishes us, when we go through these things, we should still not be discouraged. You know why? That verse says, don't be discouraged. That says, don't faint. Why? That, listen, that punishment, that spanking that God has given to you is to clean off the impurities and mistakes that you made. If God gave you a good day, after the crud that you did, something's not cleansed there. And it remains. Okay? And it, very likely that thing will haunt you later on in the future. Because your flesh is so used to getting away with it. But when God gives you a spanking, your flesh remembers it. So it has a tendency not to repeat that again. So when you're being punished by God, it is a good thing. Remember that. It's nothing to get discouraged about. Now, I know that, don't get me wrong, there is guilt, there is sorrow in sin, and I'm not telling you to clap your hands when you lose something precious in your life because of the stupid mistake you did. You should be guilty. You should realize sin has sorrow. It's a heavy price to pay. But at the same time, you should also keep in mind that other feeling that I should not let this thing discourage me into a guilt obsession, discourage me where I don't live better for God. I got to see the bright side in this, in spite of this ugly thing that happened in my life. The bright side is my flesh will never forget that and learned its lesson and my flesh better remember that feeling and that experience so that it's so traumatized to the point that it will not repeat that sin again. Okay, and then lastly, whew, all right, let's wrap things up. 
and I didn't show you all the pretty pictures that I <laughs> spent a lot of a long time, blah, 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 blah. But I hope that the blah, blah, blah was actually something that you learned valuable insights, okay? But uh, I like this quote. Backsliding happens when we tolerate the sin that Jesus died for. All right, so that will preach there. That's really, really good. And then the dangers of backsliding, which we looked at, you'll notice a cycle here that repeats. It goes with sin, then you stop following Christ, then it gets under conviction, then you confess, then you repent, you get forgiveness, you get restored, and you follow Christ, but then you sin again, and on and on the cycle goes. But here's the thing that's important to understand is that's the reason why the causes for backsliding are given and also the checkups for backsliding are given. Even though you backslide, notice the positive point. You go back up. Now, that's the important thing. You always want to go up. You don't want to go down and then keep going down and then down and down. Right? Then it's really hard to pick yourself back up. So remember, like I told you before, the checkups for backsliding and the causes for backsliding that you wrote down will always, never fail, pick you back up. Just as much as those reasons for backsliding, those sins never fail to put you down. It's as much truth and as much power that when you do those spiritual things, you always go back up. Okay? So let that encourage you. So you have to check your heart. And then you'll notice that the person right here, when he's dealing with certain people who are struggling with things, which is pretty good, is to ask these questions. Checkups for backsliding. So you have to inspect your heart. And then the last one right here is the invitation to backsliders. Now, this is one of my favorite movies. It's called Dangerous Journey. Uh, it's a, a picture mode on Pilgrim's Progress. But it's a story here about Pilgrim who was burdened with sin all that time. And then when he came to the cross, that burden of sin fell off of his back. It's a very good story. Uh, I would recommend that for kids and even grown adults. But... That's the invitation to backsliders, is to always get your sin off you. And every time you come to the cross, you can feel that burden off your shoulders. So always remember that. The cross is always available. The invitation is always open. Just as much as sin never fails to invite you to repeat the sinful process, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ never fails to always invite you to get that sin off of your shoulders. So I want you to always remember that. Now that's a huge encouragement out of today's hard lesson. The three passages that God never fails in his invitation to backsliders, which we won't turn to, is Jeremiah 3.22, Jeremiah 3.22, Hosea 14.4, Hosea 14.4, and Proverbs 24, 16. Proverbs 24, 16. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. I pray, Heavenly Father, today's teaching has blessed our people, opened our eyes. Lord, you, your word is the cure. Your word has all the answers. Always should teach us how human nature always complicates things, make it more tough than we realize. When it's so simple, it's so simple, Father, from this lesson, what we can learn. If only we can apply it. Will you help us, Father? Lord, you never fail to pick us back up. So, Lord, pick us up again. And, Lord, help us to keep pressing forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.